Well, hello and good morning, evening or afternoon, depending on when you are streaming this, the latest episode of ED's Susty Talk video interview series. If you're new to this series, where have you been? Um, we've been running them since lockdown number one here in the UK, just to keep everyone feeling connected to the sustainability conversation while we all work remotely. Um, and in recognition of the fact that our countdown to COP26 event is just a few short weeks away, we're taking the time to speak to some of our high level speakers from that event. Um, so for today's edition, I'm really delighted to have our keynote speaker, Sir Roger Gifford from the GFI on. How, how are you, Roger? I'm very well, thank you indeed. It's a lovely sunny day, spring is in the air. What's not to like? COP26 around the corner, <laughs> G7 before that. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time um, the time today. Um, I thought it would be good. I know we spoke to the GFI quite a lot last year. We speak to Rianne Marie Thomas fairly regularly. Um, but I mean, if they say if they say a week is a long time in politics, it's a long time in sustainability as as well. And I wanted to just get your thoughts on what has been a really significant few weeks for the climate agenda. So last month in April, we saw the US administration host the Climate Leaders Summit, um, really significant increase in pledges, including from the, the UK. So I wanted to, to sort of get your views on reflecting on that and looking at what, what more is now needed ahead of November. Oh, that's a big question. Sarah. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, can I say uh, what a pleasure it is to be talking to Edie. You are my favourite number one morning <laughs> news sheet, and not only because I think you have a very balanced commentary, but also you always start with something positive. So I can always feel I can face the world with another bit of good news out there, and that's a uh, that's really good to have. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, it's clear we have reached some sort of critical momentum, I would say, on climate globally. I mean, it's inconceivable that any financial institution or corporate CEO doesn't have a climate strategy either in their back pocket or very much uh, there ready ready to bring out. Inconceivable, at least in at least in the, in the, what we used to call the Western world amongst those mm -hmm. sophisticated corporates and, and financial institutions. So I think we warmly welcome the announcement from the UK government of a target of a 78% reduction in carbon emissions by 2035. It's the most ambitious globally. And if you think of how financial institutions have to react to that, they're going to be doing so. We, of course, we need to, uh, we need clarity on the delivery pathway and we need certainty around long term policy direction. Tr translating those longer term goals into practical, practical, actionable short term milestones is the key to successful climate action. It's great talking with great aspirations about how we've got to solve the problems of the world. We have to make those actionable and practical. So and so are supportive policies to channel mainstream capital towards decarbonisation of our housing stock or the transport problem or the acceleration of nature based solutions, which is rising up the agenda very fast. And it's actually the same for all sectors. It's about turning a 30 year, possibly even a 50 year discussion that we've been having into mm -hmm. a five to 10 year practical action plan. And it's also critical, I think, that the transition is fair and it's just and it, and it builds or includes an, a, a, a resilient uh, net zero economy so that we don't end up with a sort of um, we don't end up with something which looks very good on paper from a carbon point of view, but doesn't actually achieve what we want to in social terms. It simply will not get the buy in. So um, like you, I'm really looking forward to hearing more on this from Her Majesty's government over the course of this year, particularly the net zero strategy, which we expect to be issued ahead of COP. Yeah, it seems that that strategy is is the big waiting point. Obviously, we'd hope for the transport part already, but a lot of people just are really, really waiting for that, right? Absolutely, yes. Fantastic. People, people, they want to see the practical steps. Mm. Again, I think everyone's slightly overloaded with this aspiration. Uh, we all aspire. We, we want things to get better. How are we going to do it? And we, everything, I think, the steps that we take from now on have to be those practical, deliverable, actionable steps. Mm. And of course, businesses and investors will be looking for that practicality and deliverability at any point in time. But I presume that the context of the economic recovery only just makes that more more important. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. And you mentioned we're going to come on to this just recovery piece, um, just transition piece that you've you've mentioned, um, and which will obviously be the topic of your keynote in a couple of weeks time. Um, but you mentioned there's something I wanted to touch on because it's been in our headlines a lot, and that was on um, retrofitting buildings, low carbon heat, low carbon um, homes. And I know that th this was a big focus for the Institute um, last year, but obviously as we go into 2021, we're just seeing more bad news about the Green Homes Grant, it, it would seem every week. Um, so I'd love to hear how that work is going to continue for you guys this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Green Homes Grant, it sadly didn't work, but it was an example of something which was actionable, but didn't hit the spot in practical terms, in terms of in terms of getting people's buy-in and making it actually happen. Um, and I think one of the things we feel really strongly about is this idea of coalitions. So that the Coalition for the Energy Efficiency of Buildings, which is one of GFI's main bits of work, uh, certainly last year, it now has 300 members across 130 different organisations. There's nobody we can think of who is not involved in getting in that discussion and in trying to make it work. So. We also saw this year the issue of the metered energy savings report and building renovation passports, which we're looking at bringing in will shortly, and will shortly be launching something like a green mortgage hub. All of them, we have very practical ways of delivering the finance and the kind of the wherewithal to make the, 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 um, the, the, the change happen. I think there'll be a continued focus on innovations and interventions to accelerate this investment opportunity and to bring in public and private capital into retrofitting the UK's housing stock. We have, by some accounts, uh, not the very best in Europe, um, partly because of our temperate climate, but also partly because we love our very old buildings. Um, and we have to, not only for new buildings, but also in terms of retrofits, we really have to we really have to do something quite dramatic in order to change that. It's estimated that some 250 billion pounds of investment is needed to decarbonise existing UK homes. So it, it's really critical to build coordinated action between government, between industry and finance to decarbonise that UK building stock. Built environment counts some 40% of UK emissions. So it's a really significant, really significant um, part of the whole. Um, it's also great to see, I think, that the built environment is a key focus for COP26 as well. It's very mm -hmm. important. Buildings are, after all, responsible for 28% of global energy related emissions in 2019. So it's natural to be focusing on houses, on buildings and on making them as efficient, not least for cooling in much of the world as much as for heating. Fantastic. Well, I'll keep my eyes out for more on that this year after learning a bit more about heat in some of our recent recent contexts as well. I can imagine that the cooling piece is is just the same. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, obviously you've already mentioned the importance that all of this is done in a in a just manner, that it's not enough just to get to that 250 billion. It has to be done in the right way and going to the right things so that it works for for people as well as planet and it works in real life as, as well as on paper. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of talk about ways that the UK's financial system can do better at that recently. Um, but I'd love to get your views on that personally and some more information on the GFI's own plans about that that justness of the of the transition. Which is another very big question. Very yes. <laughs> one person's just isn't necessarily another person's fair. Uh, so that there has to be a lot of work done on that too. But if we say that the goal is to build an inclusive and resilient net zero economy, take that as a phrase, an inclusive and resilient net zero economy, you can see that the two objectives are inextricably linked. And when something doesn't work, like the Green Homes Grant, you can see that too. Why didn't it work? You can you can discuss that one for, for some time, but clearly it wasn't seen to be fair as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a scheme that was being rolled out. So, Yes, it is very important that we embed social considerations in everything we do, because apart from anything else, it won't happen if they're not there. So that, that's why it's so important to use public capital as efficiently as possible, focusing on, for instance, on grant based funding in areas where private capital has less scope to be involved, such as social housing, and using using de-risking vehicles where the scope to build scalable investment opportunities for the private sector exists, such as in green mortgages. Great opportunity to do green mortgages. I, I often mention that Fannie Mae of the United States has over a hundred billion dollars of green mortgages for its multifamily apartment blocks. Here we have a much smaller figure. What works in one country doesn't necessarily work in another, and we want to make it work here too. And I think the same approach can apply to international climate finance as well, apportioning risk 
across public and private sectors as effectively as possible to ensure the most efficient use of public impact capital. That immediately sounds like an aspiration. And it is an aspiration, but I think if it can drive some of the practical actions that we can take as well, I think we have a, 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 a good opportunity of making that work. I, I'd also like to use aid um, to support the most vulnerable countries to build up their own resilience, adapting to climate change and driving this post-COVID COVID recovery. Again, an aspiration, but there's no reason why the two shouldn't be put together. And in middle in income countries, where there's already a well-functioning capital market, local money, local capital available, you have these uh, amazing de-risking vehicles that can be used to help crowd in domestic private capital, helping those ca capital markets mature and also providing critical financial support. I think the UK's Green Plus um, guilt is a real milestone because it'll be it'll be reporting on the on the social benefits uh, sorry the social co-benefits and launching a linked green retail product which mm. will have um, effectively saving it'll be a savings product with benefits from the same innovative reporting standards good reporting standards amongst the top innovations were what investors were calling for when that green plus guilt was in formation so i think these i think the idea of innovation bringing that in is absolutely at the forefront of, of certainly the financiers thinking, helping to future proof, if you like, the Green Guilt Issuance Programme, which we hope to see many times bigger than it is today. Mm. And I think thankfully some of the things that you mentioned have been selected by the UK's COP unit as themes. So adaptation and resilience is a theme and, and climate finance is, is a theme. So I'm presuming that that was a, a positive signal for you, for you guys at the GFI. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, as always, devil in the details. We'll be waiting to see what happens on, on the day. But yeah, interesting themes from our side of things. I, I, I'm, I'm very conscious that it, it is easy to be either overly positive or overly aspirational. Again, what Rian Marie Thomas at the Green Finance Institute will tell you is that she is ruthlessly practical. We use the word ruthlessly deliberately because it's ruthlessly practical about what works and what doesn't work. If it doesn't work, there's no point wasting time on it because it becomes just another aspiration. We've got to find solutions that work for people, for finance and for the companies that are going to be helping build the, the new heating and, and, and cooling systems. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, and we've talked there about some big sort of national level packages, so the Green Gill, international finance, things like that. Um, and you've mentioned some of the retail offerings for private sector organisations in finance, so like mortgages and other other packages. Um, but here at ED, we have listeners from all over the private sector, so loads of different places. Um, and you mentioned that most CEOs will have a climate plan already out or sitting in their back pocket or at the top of their to do list. Um, but I wanted to get your advice on making sure that they're properly financed and as we mentioned that they're just as, as well as just net zero. Yeah, I mean, because the corporates are clearly going to drive this whole thing to happen and it must be commercial for the corporates and they must believe in it and want to make that investment for change. Um, so again, you come back to this thing of collaboration being absolutely key. And it's why we uh, are working very closely with the private sector, not just with the banks, but across the whole value chain of, of a sector to build solutions that are implementable and scalable and that we think can create the necessary transition on the ground. The, I think the corporate sector is making a lot of progress. I mean, think where we were just three or four years ago. Think of the approaches that we had around mining and coal and biodiversity five, six years ago. And you can see that we are really truly in the middle of an extraordinary transition in the way people think and also in the way they act. And this, this feels like an unstoppable boulder rolling down a kind of a rolling down the hill kind of idea. So things like the um, things, things like the kind of the, the UNFCCC's race to net zero campaign, which now covers nearly 25 percent of global carbon emissions and over 50 percent of GDP. These are these are aspirational, but they're also extremely um, practical in their end effects. And I think the initiatives that are underlying that particular campaign, they're setting out frameworks, frameworks for companies to use to help shape the transition of their business models, which are at the end of the day founded in science. Another of my bugbears, please government invest more in science and research. That is what is going to bring the real change, real change to real carbon dioxide levels over time. And let's face it, at the end of the day, for corporates, this is a shareholder issue that is only going to grow over time. It's not going away.
Well, I can't think of a better call to action to end our talk on today, Roger. But um, yes, if you guys listening at home have enjoyed our conversation, there will be much more of the at, at our countdown to COP26 event on Thursday, the 20th of May. Um, it's an all day event in a virtual format where Sir Roger is going to be giving the keynote speech again on the just transition. Um, topic, but we've also got speakers from organisations including the Climate Group, Natural England, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and of course the COP26 team themselves. So make sure that you register if you have enjoyed this conversation. You can find full details at ed.net by clicking events. Um, but for now that's all we have time for. So thank you so much Sir Roger for your time. Welcome, lovely to see you Sarah. Thanks. Great.